Hello, I'm Tim Mathias. I'm the strategic lead at UK Active. Um, we're the trade body for fitness and leisure in the physical activity industry. And look, the physical activity sector has an essential role in narrowing the disparities and inequalities, and they're faced by disabled people every day. Our vision at UK Active is to develop a sector that's freely accessed and utilised by all, enabling everyone to be active and participate in any capacity that they wish. And as a sector's trade body, we're uniquely placed to deliver on this, drawing on our partnerships to raise awareness across the sector, grow our relationship with the disability sector for true collaboration, and then also convene our membership, operators and suppliers to learn sharings and evidence. We have a key commitment to disability called Everyone Can. It's an ongoing agenda to set a collaborative tone for inclusion and accessibility across the whole fitness and leisure sector. We want to continue to improve standards for disabled people in every community. And really key to this is this collaborative approach. Some of our work has shown that improving customer service and confidence of the workforce is going to be key to our progression and transformation as a sector. Our Everyone Can report showed that more guidelines are needed to attract people with a disability into employment. And we definitely have a role to play in promoting the fantastic employability leisure guides that are being launched today. Alongside this, last year we launched a report called The Future of Public Leisure, and it clearly stated that we can do more as a sector to be more representative of the communities we serve. Another key reason why we're backing employability leisure and this fantastic launch today. I'm really looking forward over the course of this session to talking to some key figures across the sector. One's going to be Brian Carling, the Chief Executive of Aspire. We've got Jennifer Huygen from Community Leisure UK. And also Sam James, a disabled fitness professional, acting as an instructor as well. Brian Carling from Aspire, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Um, do you mind letting us know sort of who you are, who you work for in your role as well? Yeah, okay, my name is Brian Carlin and I'm Chief Executive at Aspire. And Aspire is a national spinal cord injury charity working throughout the UK, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. Really, really good. And Aspire set up um, employability leisure to help disabled people gain qualifications and work in the leisure industry. What was your role and Aspire's role in this? How did it all come about? Um, Aspire has always enjoyed a remarkably high percentage of um, disabled people within our workforce. And it became apparent to me that having come from contract leisure management, that, that was not reflected in the rest of the leisure industry. And it was also um, apparent that the barriers were not just attitudes from the industry, it was about physical um, barriers, it was about economic barriers. So we wanted to find a solution to those problems, and that was to create a training program that could support disabled people with physical, sensory, cognitive, mental and health difficulties to gain industry qualifications, supported work experience and successful permanent employment. So really we just wanted to create an opportunity that could reflect what we had within our, our workforce. And it wasn't just necessarily about the workforce, it's about the fact that we have an unprecedented 37% use of our services at the Aspire Leisure Centre by disabled customers. And if you think that 98% of society will become disabled in our lifetime, it makes perfect sense that the leisure industry should be doing everything it can to attract disabled customers. And I just believe we have a welcoming and a more reflective workforce to represent society as a whole and I think that that's what makes us so successful and hopefully the leisure industry will embrace as well. Just that's that around 37% uh, usage by disabled people at your centre, um, definitely over indexing. You do so many things so well at Aspire to cater for disabled people. What does it actually look like on the ground um, in terms of your inclusion of disabled people at the centre? Um, <laughs> I'm going to take you to my first ever interview at Aspire and I was asked a question at the very end of my understanding and experience of disability to which I replied I didn't think I had any 
and I saw frowns upon the chief executive and the chair of the board. And and then I thought to myself, well, actually, um, perhaps my sister, who was born with hydrocephalus and spina bifida and spent 50% of her childhood in hospital, missed out on huge amounts of education and faced, you know, negative attitudes from other pupils at school and general members of the public. But I never actually saw my sister as being disabled. I just saw Janice, my sister. And I think what's different at Aspire, the culture and what it looks like on the ground is exactly that. You know, within Aspire, we have a culture where we don't see disability. We see a customer or we see an employee or we see someone delivering training. You know, that's the difference within a spa. It's a world where, you know, wherever your disability is or whoever you are, that can stay in the car park. You know, once you enter our building, you know, it's a, it's a world where everyone is completely equal. Really, really good. The, 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 the guidance, the employability ledger guidance that we're encouraging operators to download and, and read and take note of as part of this launch, it, it talks about the importance of an inclusive culture. Um, and that really is, it needs to be driven from the top. And as a chief executive, how, how do you go about doing that, really driving inclusion from the top down? Um, first of all, we need to ensure that we have equal representation of disabled and non-disabled people on our board who are ultimately responsible for the governance of the charity. Um, we have to ensure that we have all the positive policies in place, that our staff are trained in disability awareness, and that we also ensure that our policies don't just embrace our ability to attract and employ disabled people, but it's there embedded within our communications. Signing up to being a disability confident uh, employer is a fantastic, and we are um, a leader within that um, accreditation. So um, we are there now helping to support other organisations to improve their capabilities in employ directly employing positively disabled people. So it's channel swims, triathlons, there's a video online of you shuffling a pack of cards whilst on, on, on a bike also. So your role as a chief executive re really pushing inclusion from the top downwards. Is it your role solely as a chief executive? Who, who else is kind of responsible for inclusion across your organisation? Our entire leadership team and every manager and every employee. It's not, it's not just about from the leadership. If you can, you can be an inclusive leadership team, but if you haven't ensured that you're driving that message constantly, that you're providing that support and that training and that guidance to your staff and to your customers, then that, that's where it's really important. You know, the leisure industry is, has a relatively high turnover of young employees and ensuring that your training program isn't just a tick box one off. It has to be consistent. And that's where you, your policies aren't just about creating policies. It's ensuring it's embedded within the culture of the organization and ensuring that every employee plays their role in understanding disability and how that affects different people in different ways. The employability leisure guide explains kind of the myriad of benefits if we get inclusion right, if we have disabled people in the workforce. Are there any particular areas that Aspire has really benefited from by having disabled people working for, for you and with you? One, we have remarkable longevity within our workforce. Um, I, I can't prove that evidence base that if you employ disabled people, you will retain your workforce even longer. You know, that would be a ridiculous thing to claim. But I can say that we have employees, even at senior levels, working beyond 25 years within Aspar so far. Um, and our turnover is much lower than the rest of the leisure industry. And I guess just to finish up, what would be your, your key message to, to leisure operators about attracting disabled people to work in their, their, their organisation? Employers need to see people, not disability. 
they need to recognize the potential in everyone and the part that they play within society. There's a definite underrepresentation of disabled people within the workforce, within the leisure, leisure industry, and I'd love to see that addressed and make it a more welcoming environment for people. Having a wide range of society represented within your workforce means that you will attract that wide range of society as we see it. You know, we should be more reflective of the percentages of our population that we support. And right now, if the industry is only tapping into maybe 3% use by disabled customers and yet 18% of society are disabled and we're achieving 37%, that's an awful lot of customers leisure operators are missing out on. The purple pound is powerful, over 87.5 billion pounds of disposable income a year in the UK alone. Key message is, it makes great business sense to level up your workforce and create a welcoming and, and inclusive environment within your leisure facility. Thank you so much for your thoughts. It's so good to hear from a senior leader, chief executive, really backing this agenda uh, and promoting this culture of inclusion across fitness and leisure. Um, Brian Carling, the chief executive of Aspire, thank you so much for, for joining us and your commitment to, to inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good for you to join us, Jen. Jennifer Hoygen from Community Leisure UK. Um, they're going to head of policy and strategic partnerships. Can you tell us a little bit about Cell UK and, and what you do and what, 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 what this is all about? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much for involving me. We're really, really happy to support Employability Leisure. Um, so we are a membership association. Um, we work with charities and social enterprises in the public leisure and culture sector, uh, and we refer to them as le leisure and culture trusts. Um, we work across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and because we are a membership association, one of our you know, strategic objectives, as you, as you would call them, um, is to ensure that our members are sustainable and resilient organizations. And of course, a big part of that is equality, diversity and inclusion, making sure that they are inclusive of the communities that they actually work with. Um, so we've been having a lot of different conversations around equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, we've covered topics like disability inclusion, but also around workforce diversity, concession policies, women and girls as well, just to make sure that we we cover everything really. Um, and you know, there's new guidance, but generally the whole push towards employability leisure is going to be really important in terms of actually knowing what actionable steps organizations can take. And I think that is, you know, I know we'll I know we'll get into it a little bit deeper, but um, I'm really excited about this guidance and what it can do for our sector and, and providing that little bit more support and, and structure that we need. Amazing. So good to have CL UK's kind of involvement and backing and Employability leisure guidance, does that really fit in with, with, with where your members are at and what they really require at the moment with regards to disability? Yeah, I think so, because you know, one of the conversations that we've that we've had with our members is, is that they're obviously very keen to, to do the right thing. Um, and to, to be inclusive towards everyone and accessible as well. Um, but one of the main barriers that, that members have shared with us, and, they, and I found that really brave of them to admit that actually one of the things that they, they will need to overcome within their organizations is to be able to have the conversation with their staff and their workforce about diversity um, because they are afraid to offend people or to offend staff members. They feel like they need to have a legitimate purpose almost to, to, you know, to ask about do you have a disability or do you need additional support um, and so actually I think this you know the new guidance will actually really help with having that conversation and, and you know giving guidance and structure around communication and explaining why are we asking these questions and where do we want to go to as an organization as well. I think the, the discussion around disability is often focused on participation um, where do you think we're at and what is the role that employability leisure can play in terms of pushing the agenda to disabled people in the workforce? 
Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that. And I think actually there's a lot that we can learn from the participation point of view. So, you know, leisure operators, whether that's in the public or, you know, private sector, they will be used to being inclusive and accessible from a participation point of view because of all the health and well-being programs that they run on a daily basis. So they will feel quite confident in terms of engaging um, disabled people in that way. But now is the question of actually translating that to actually being a fully inclusive organization, because you can be really good from your participation point of view, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is in place in terms of that inclusive culture as an organization. And I think this is where employability as a as a wider initiative can really open up that conversation within this sector saying, we're doing really well on participation on this, on, on this front, but now let's reflect back internally. What does that mean for us in our, as an organization? And I think the guidance that is coming out uh, today is really, really helpful because of that checklist that is there at the start. And I love that checklist because it's right at the start and it will allow you to actually check and challenge the work that you do and just go to the relevant sections that, that you will need to just reflect on your work, to adapt your work. But also, very honestly, if you need to start afresh, you can because of that checklist and that guidance that is there. Yeah, the employability leisure guide it, it has so many amazing kind of practical implementable elements to it um really good that you mentioned the checklist within there i think there's one element that has really struck me and it, it, you've mentioned this inclusive culture um starting from the top what's the role that you think chief executive senior leadership can can kind of play to, to push disability in the workforce I think they have a really important role to play um, because they, you know, they're the leaders within their organization. They need to show that that they care and that the organization cares and, and, and will put in the support and will be able to have an honest conversation within the organization. This is what we're doing well, but this is potentially what we're not doing well yet. And, you know, this is difficult sometimes to admit we're not doing this well, but, you know, we will adapt and we want to have a conversation with you, our staff, to actually improve. And one of the things that was really reassuring to, to me working with so many members across the UK is that when we started our EDI work um, a year, year and a half ago, I can't quite remember when we started to really put it as a, as a real focus with dedicated workshops, one of the things that we never had to do was to explain why we're focusing on equality, diversity and inclusion. It actually, it was a relief for members that we were providing a space for them to network, to share examples, to ask the silly questions um, and to be reassured that there is support and guidance out there for them, you know, to, to reflect on their work and to improve where needed. Yeah, it's such a really crucial, important element of, of, of the debate and the conversation around equality, diversity, inclusion. Let's get us out in the open, let's have the discussion. Um, no silly questions, as, as he mentioned, for us to, to, to kind of progress. Um, so employability, leisure, you've got these amazing resources and the guides sort of being published. Um, you've men mentioned the checklist. I love the bit about senior leadership, the benefits of having an inclusive culture. Is there a particular element that's really caught your eye and your interest with, within the guides? Yeah, I mean, there's many different elements um, and literally every chapter to me I found inspiring. And I know that I will go back to many of the sections just for myself to, to help guide my own work with members and, and, and in the sector working with partners as well. But I think for me, there were three, three sections really that really spoke to me. So one of is, of course, the checklist, which I already, already mentioned, but also the reason why I love the checklist so much. It's not just because it's, it helps you you know, check your work, but also because it's themed across, you know, three different themes. So it's wider strategic planning as an organization. It is preparing the workforce, having that conversation, but also looking at policies and plans as an organization. So really you can quickly see where you as an organization want to learn and then go to that section, which I think is really helpful. Um, the second bit, and, we've, and I think we've, you know, we've We've mentioned it um, during this conversation, but really important to stress is that inclusive culture 
as an organization. And that is something that came out of the workshops that we've been doing in the, in the past few months really quite strongly is that, you know, you can have a diverse workplace that is potentially representative of your community, but that doesn't mean that you are inclusive in the way that you operate. So there's a risk that the way that you operate may be tokenistic if you don't have that truly inclusive culture as an organization. And that is why if you get inclusion right, you will get diversity right, and that will happen more holistically as well. And I think that is such an important message that this guidance stresses, but also that it gives actionable uh, objectives on as well and to help guide organizations. Um, the final point, and I'm conscious that I'm basically just giving you a whole summary of the, of the guidance here, but the final point that I do really, really want to stress is that there are a couple of sections in there that are about making job roles more accessible, looking at you know the day-to-day -day, um, work that you do and how to ch potentially make changes there, but also looking at general workplace practices um, that you can um, reflect on and potentially make changes if needed. And when I was reading through the actions in those sections, I was thinking, actually, I would really like that. Um, I don't consider myself to be a disabled person. I don't identify as a disabled person. But for me, um, you know, looking through that guidance, I think if organizations, if employers put all of that into practice, their organization will be so much better for everyone. And actually the health and well-being of all of their staff, whether those are disabled uh, people or non-disabled people, they will feel supported and valued in the organization. Jen, what an amazing sort of point to end on. Thank you so much for joining You're us. You're welcome. Jen. So good to be joined by Sam James, fitness industry professional. Um, look, do you mind Sam telling us about how you got involved in, in fitness and leisure and sort of your amazing career to date? Yeah, so I um, first of all got into it, um, I had a, a crack the bone in my shoulder and it's through the rehab that I saw the power of exercise. I worked with not only a physio but a personal trainer and I had more results from the personal trainer than the actual physio and it was that personal trainer that said oh you should train to you should be a great person to work with disabled people you should have told me what qualifications I had and then I googled found instructability applied got on the course that I passed that's nine years ago and through the um, work placement we had to do on instructability I did a work placement in my local country gym got taken on as a casual, worked around different sites and I ended up in the exercise referral team and I've been there nine years and I've um, moved around a little bit, I've worked in some schools, disabled schools, I've also am now working in the disability um, team so I'm now project manager of Active Inclusive Swindon which is our local disability sport offer to get the inactive active so I've really worked my way up from the bottom, right, sort of, nearly to the top. Um, I also run my own business, so I am a qualified rehab personal trainer, and I also teach group fitness classes. And group fitness essentially is more my passion. It's how I, I love making making people feel good in the exercise class around other people because you have the social social element there which I think a lot of people need, especially disabled people as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Wow. Nine years in the industry. And I guess, I hope you don't mind me asking this question. Have you, have you faced many barriers as a disabled person in the industry? I've, I haven't faced that many. I think that for me, because I do teach group fitness and I teach it for everyone so I don't just teach disabled people I teach actually in gyms and like normal mainstream classes is that some gyms won't take me on because of a disability they have that viewpoint of you that you can't teach a class or they won't give you a try and you know and I think that's the only barrier that I've had but I've just gone on and ignored that and I just work for places that actually want me working for them and when I have I've, got, I've done really really well in one place I've been there for eight years and my class is very bit every week so it goes to show that if you give someone a chance 
and let them build that class up over time that they can go and achieve great things. Really, really good to to hear that, Sam. I guess my next question would be, what do you think the fitness and leisure industry needs to do to become a more attractive career option for disabled people? First of all, I think the, the first of all, they need more disabled people in advertising. I think that when you look at a inclusive membership, say for example, they, inc- they have got a disability or inclusive membership, it's, your, it's normally older people or a wheelchair person in that in that actual advertising. But if that is only a very small percentage of disabled people, disabled people can you know be ambulant. They could have like walking aids. They could be vision impaired, hearing impaired. So it doesn't actually reflect the true disability population. Um, also, I think that. The, if they did that, the more people that they have going in that are disabled, it also showcases that they are inclusive and that might then turn that they might have more disabled staff. Does it matter if it's on reception, as admin, gym instructors, teaching classes? But in my experience, it's in my job that disabled people respond better to disabled staff. So all my clients they all respond to me because I'm in a similar situation to them. And I got people, disabled people with CP that come to my classes because I got CP. So that when I'm demonstrating a move, they and they can see me doing that, so they know that's how they gotta do it. Whereas they haven't got another instructor or another person trying to correct them because they're doing it slightly differently. You know, you, you raised such an amazing point and I couldn't help but notice on, on, on your own website some of the testimonials from your clients that have come through. There's one that really sort of stuck out for me and it was an individual who was perhaps a little bit nervous about getting in touch, a little bit nervous about attending for the first time. Um, what's the role of, 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 of an instructor to kind of ease someone into fitness and allay their concerns, do you think? I think that regardless if there's a disability or not, I think everyone is nervous about attending a class to start with. They, I think they all think it's going to be full of gym bunnies, it's going to be really high impact, when actually the whole purpose of a class is to be fully inclusive, it's to have every level from beginner right up and to give options to everyone. And they should actually talk to the instructor because if they actually talk to the instructor, get to know that instructor before they attend, they can actually squash any of those qualms or uh, worries that they might have. And like the one the lady that you mentioned actually, she's been with me since the start of lockdown. She joined during lockdown because she's actually lives just in Scotland and she has been one of my most regular clients and she's virtually avoided a hip replacement because she's been coming to my classes and actually doing three or four classes a week online and she said that the difference yourself in her mobility has really, really improved. Yeah, look, look that, that testimonial really struck a chord with me in terms of that initial nervousness, the great work you've done mm-hmm. and kind of transformation, if you will. Um, so look, we're here sort of celebrating launching the Employability Leisure Guides. Um, you've been given a sneak peek of them. Um, I mean, yes. it's the launch. Um, what are your thoughts on them? Um, I, it's quite interesting and I thought it's quite in-depth. So it's quite a lot of information in there for prospective employee, employers. And the fact is that it's got lots of stats in there as well. I think, I think actually employees that don't employ disabled people need to see those stats so they actually see how big, how big the gap actually is. And to me, disabled people are more loyal because we need a job, we like to stay in the job, we don't like to chop and change jobs, so we are more loyal and it's, I just found it very easy to read as well. You know, I read it after class last night, it's quite easy to read, it's quite colourful, and there's a graphics in there. So does it matter if you're a visual person or you prefer a like, fairy, there is stuff in there for everyone to pick out. Yeah, and within the guides, there's some sections around the benefits of an inclusive workplace, inclusive culture. 
What do you feel are the key elements that make a workplace really inclusive? I think it's the fact that it's not to home in on a disability. I think as soon as you home in on someone's disability, that, that, is, that stops that inclusivity there and then. Um, my manager does not see me as disabled. He sees me as any other, one, any other person in the team. And even when I've gone for promotion, I've been treated exactly the same. And, you know, and they just make allowances or adaptations for me on the things that I struggle with or it's impossible for me to do. And it, it, it's not been hard for them. It's just that it's just been put into a place, been put into a risk assessment, and then it's, it's actually there in black and white so that the whole team can see it. And I think get someone disabled person in working, even as a volunteer to start with, get to know them and then see what they can do, see how they can adapt the work and see the benefits on the centre, whatever it is, get them in and so they can show, that, show you what their capabilities are. Just let them thrive, because if you let them thrive, they will thrive. Sam James, thank you so much for joining us to celebrate the launch of Employability Leisure. Thank you for your commitment. Cheers so much. Thank you. That's okay, thank you.